So um, if you are a consumer of technology news, but you will hardly have escaped the stories and the images about how drones are going to deliver all our parcels, right? So whenever these days I order something online, I, afterwards I keep staring out of the window, hoping for the drone to come, uh, but it hasn't happened. And uh, not surprisingly, this like so many images from this area, it's just a computer rendering. Right? And the reality looks more like this, right? <laughs> that uh, our, our drones are not able to deal with the natural uh, environment uh, to the extent that they should. Uh, but uh, that we cannot do it doesn't mean it cannot be done. It can be done. It's done probably more than a billion times every night by the bats, right, who can actually have very agile flight and who inhabit very uh, complex habitats. So this is a, uh, what we want to make our principal field site for this work on the island of Borneo. I was just there over spring break in the night. I ran into a branch. I got the sutures pulled last week. So I can tell you that I have heads-on experience in uh, how complex these habitats are and how difficult it is um, to move in the night. So how do the bats um, do that? Well, the short answer is I don't know, so thank you for your attention. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, there are some interesting things uh, that are going on. But if the bats, the bats, when the bats emit the sound, in a sophisticated bat, it comes out of the nostrils. They have like a megaphone. And you can see that the walls of the megaphone are moving. Same thing, the ears of a bat. Uh, they are not, our ears live a lazy life, hang on the side of the head, do nothing. In the bats, they change shape. So that's a, a reconstruction. That's what's going on. This bat emits. The the megaphone changes shape, the bed receives, the, the ears change shape, and that all happens very quickly, right? So this is heavily slowed down stuff here, so these are just uh, fractions of a second that, that all this, this happens. And um, so actually, it, it sort of to summarize, but in, if you look at technical systems that emit or receive waves, whether it's electromagnetic waves or um, um, sound waves, right, there's three things what you can do with a receiver. Right, you can reorient it, and that's what we are doing right when you have an antenna on a pen tilt unit. So bats do that with their ears, and we do it too. But then you can actually change the shape of the antenna. You can deform it. Bats do that, and we don't. And even more interesting, you can make nonlinear effects. Bats move their ears so fast, their ears so fast, that they introduce a Doppler shift into the signal just by moving the ears fast. It's something that bats do, and we don't do it. Don't, don't do it. So we wonder what. What is that good for? And so we built our own little bat robots to, to mimic this. Right? So here's the, um, the emitter, here are the ears. Right? So there's little motors behind. This is an older version uh, that was sort of actuated with a lever from behind. We have since gone uh, soft robotic. Right? So here now we have pneumatic uh, muzzles on the, on the pinner. So we have four now, the real bat, that's a picture from the 1960s that shows the muscles of a real bat, a bit more than 20 muscles on an ear. So we have 20% of the degrees of freedom that the bat has on an on a ear right now. Um, so that is actually any good. Right? So here is some work that we have done to use traditional sonar sensing paradigms and see um, how this uh, moving the ear may help. Right? So on the left hand side, this is about resolution. So how many different directions can you distinguish? Uh, so the, in, in bits, how many directions, how, what's the direction resolution? And you see this is the curve. It depends on the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and this is the curve for static. And this is the curve for dynamic. Right? So you can do several orders of magnitude more direction resolution if you actually change the shape of your ear than if you keep it constant. The other picture here, this is about uh, accuracy, right? So how accurate can you tell the direction? So the uh, magenta ellipses here on, superposed on the beam pattern of the system, they tell you 90% conf confidence intervals, right? If I know uh, the target is really at this direction in the middle of the ellipse, so 90% of my uh, estimates are in this ellipse. So you can see right-hand side dynamic, really nice small ellipses, left-hand side static, much more messy, much larger uh, error ellipses. So for the traditional sonar paradigms, this, this, this does something, this is useful. Uh, but we are into what happens in a forest. So my collaborators here, three of my students, are sitting there. They have taken walks in the woods while I paid them. Um, and, uh, but they have carried the sonar head with them. Right? So here you see one of their walks in the, in the woods on GPS. And then here you see what they recorded. And they were very hard at work. They recorded more than 220,000 
echoes from the real environment. Right? So what you see here, the head of these spermatozoans here, uh, this is the uh, the direct pulse, right, the pass through from the mouth to the ear, and these little wiggles in the back, that's what the bat has to go by. Right? That's how they avoid bumping into things, that's how they find their food, that's after flying maybe 50 miles out in one night and then back, right? that's how they find their way home, all on those little wiggles, and that's, that's our task. Right? We want to reproduce that, we want to be able to do the same, uh, the same thing. We have also have some lab data here, Ray Hau. He has a little robot that is mounted on a linear track, and then he has a, a, a plastic hatch in the lab. And uh, I'm showing you this work to show you that actually even with the classical machine learning, I hope you will not throw some foul tomatoes at me or things like that. So even with the classical deep learning paradigms, you can discover new things. Right, so the question here was, can we find a gap in foliage? Right, so you see here in this hatch, here Ray Hau has a little gap. And uh, that is actually for sonar engineers is very problematic. Right? So the, the traditional idea for a sonar engineer would be I, I concentrate my sound in a narrow beam. If the, this is the hatch, here's the gap. Right? So if my beam passes through that gap, then what's going to happen is right, as I scan the hatch looking for the gap, right, I will get a high echo return. Then when I'm in the gap, I get a low return. And when I'm back, I get a high return. Right? But as I narrow the gap, compared to my weak, uh, to my beam width, right, this step will get narrower and narrower, and eventually I cannot do it anymore. Right? And these bats, um, right, uh, so how narrow a beam you can make, there's some basic physics there, it depends on how large you are with the wavelengths. And the bats have the disadvantage, right? they're not nuclear submarines, right? they're tiny, right? so they have to be small, and so that's the situation. How can they still do it? Right? So, um, so this is how good this, an energy detector would perform for a scenario. The hatch is 1 meter 40 away. The gap is 30 centimeters in the widest direction. And, and so this is a, a for operating characteristic. So here's the false alarms and here's the percent of hits. And uh, guessing would be the diagonal. So you see this energy detector for that scenario here, it's still performing much better than average, uh, than uh, random guessing. But Imagine you have to navigate on that. Let's take a point here, right? So say we have 10% false alarm and then about 50% hits, right? So what that means if I walk on those long winded corridors that we were asked to walk uh, along every day, uh, right? and imagine, so you walk 100 meters and so you have doors that are one meter wide. So there could be 100 doors, right? So if you do this here, 10% false alarm means you will run your face into the wall 10 times on the way to the, to the coffee break, right? And out of the doors that are there, you will miss half of them. Right, that you could take your miss after. So, so above, ever, above chance level, but not good. So, so Rehau, what he did is he took spectrograms or spigrams of the signal and then trained a convolutional neural network. And lo and behold, that's his performance. Right, right there, it's not perf perfect, but, but with the thickness of the line, you cannot see it. Right, so right there. Right, so there is new features in this data. Uh, and that's, by the way, that's what uh, spectrogram, spigram would just look uh, the same way, um, look like, right, without gap, with gap. You look at them, you see nothing, but the deep learning finds something. So, so we find that very uh, interesting. So why do I think, of course, that's again the traditional deep learning. So again, my apologies for bringing that up here. Uh, but I think there's actually a good match here for the uh, neuromorphic, particularly the spiking computing, right? So first of all, when you have this moving nose leaf, this moving ears, the information is in the time domain. So if you want an argument, why should you have time? Well, everything here that you see is happening in time. The other thing is, that the time scales are really short, right? So the longest for those bad biosonar pulses is maybe 50 milliseconds, and that's already a freak, right? Typically, it's more like 10, 15 milliseconds. But bat brains, bat brains are not much faster and substantially faster than our brains, right? So the spike rates that you're getting are the same, just the signals are so much shorter, right? So if you wonder, right, is there a nice model system where you have just a few spikes and now you have to decide, well, uh, that's it. Right. Um, the, the last thing is, right, if you want to control this, right, so the, I, I think any system is you can assume it's best, right, if you have an adaptive control, right, so you, you control the mobility uh, from what you get back, right, so again, you're talking tens of pulses per second or so, so you really need to act fast, right, so a neuromorphic uh, hardware in that loop, 
that would be really the right thing to do. And if you're not convinced yet, then I have some pilot data to show for the rest of the talk, so you'll see a bit in what direction this could, could go. So we have been playing around um, and, and asking ourselves, um, so how would that match up with the, um, with the representation? So we have sort of designed a, in, in software a system where we have a model for the primary representation that is formed inside the, the animal. Right? So that would be the, in the inner ear, the basal membrane, right? different models. I'll discuss that, those in a second. And then also a, a different spiking models for how we make the spikes to see how does that play with the features. And this is on this 20, 220,000 uh, uh, echo monster data set right? that sort of covers the Virginia, the natural spots on the Virginia Tech campus. So for the input, um, the inner ear uh, of any mammal, human, bat, whatever it is, it is, a, it is a filter bank. And so we have tried different levels of complexity that hearing researchers have been uh, playing with, right? Some, from simple linear models with a symmetric transfer function. So this is called the gamma tone filter banks. So you see these, all these symmetric bandpass filters here. Then you can stay linear, but give the uh, filter transfer functions, some asymmetry, which is what you see in, in hearing. That's called the gamma chirp. So we have that. And then we have also used a, a nonlinear model. Right? So this model has actually a linear path and from the input to the output, and also a nonlinear path. I mean, it's also mostly linear, but there's one nonlinearity in there. So now you can adjust the transfer function depending on the input. So we've played with those as different uh, inputs. And then we have a, a survey two still fairly simple but different complexity spike model leaky integrate and fire where we just have three parameters and then response kernels where we have uh, six parameters and play with those and see can they actually these different models help us to um, to preserve that information coding capacity that the peripheral dynamics gives us uh, and um, so here's sort of the example how we uh, play with those uh, parameters and then of course they get different uh, responses from the spike models and so we have done that 220,000 uh, uh, times. The, what we have done is we just look at entropy as a way to gauge uh, coding capacity. Uh, we have more fancy methods than the direct entropy but it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, just, it's just sort of as a, a reminder what we are doing here. This actually is um, differential entropy for the uh, continuous, the analog outputs from the um, from the um, filter banks, and uh, then you can see indeed. Um, so uh, it, it depends on frequency, on the center frequency along the filter bank, and um, it, you can see a difference between static and dynamic. So this is how dynamic would change with frequency. This is how the static case, right? So the. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Mm? What, what does negative entropy mean? Uh, yeah, that's with the differential entropy, right? It, it goes positive and negative. So it's it's quite a beast to understand what it actually does, right? But but different uh, the Shannon entropy is always. It just depends on your binning, right? Mm -hmm. You can just put it up over zero and it has the same meaning exactly. Yeah, we are just looking at the difference between the two, right? So we are, we are just considering right. yeah. the difference from from there. Yes, with the differential entropy, it has this. The Shannon entropy cannot be negative, but the differential entropy can, and and it, it is a beast. And so if somebody has a better, we have some ideas, but. I'm still also collecting ideas how we can do that at this level, right, with the analog signal, I mean, the continuous signals. Um, uh, then here we are, we are playing on the spike. Uh, so here, just really, just the story is uh, there is a difference at this level in the amount of en the entropy that you can get with static and dynamic, and that difference is always or almost always positive. Right, so for most of the frequencies, it is positive. Then we can play with the parameters here uh, for the, um, this is the uh, leaky integrate and fire model. And you can again see, right, if you vary the time constant, if you vary the firing threshold, right, you get different levels uh, of entropy out of that um, for our input. Um, and this sort of summarizes, right, that both the basilar membrane model, the initial primary uh, representation and also the um, spike model both have effects. Right? So these are the three different uh, basilar membrane models, the gamma tone, the linear filter bank, the asymmetric linear filter bank, the nonlinear uh, filter bank. And you can see this, if you look at this is the difference in entropy uh, percent wise between dynamic and static. 
um, and you can see right, whether which one I use. And then these are three sets of model parameters for the um, response kernels. And you can see that both of those things have um, an influence, right? So it really matters how you process your signal, what's your neuromorphic representation. So it's not about, oh yeah, you're going to do this in the periphery, and then you're doing something to process the signal, and it doesn't matter. Right? So we feel if we optimize those things together, right? so we have a parameter space that contains what we do in the periphery, what we do with our primary representation, what we do with our spike codes, right? if we optimize this and do it right, we can boost our coding capacity. Right? So the, the exhaustive search uh, we had hoped that we would have those results ready now, but then uh, the, the supercomputer didn't, uh, it wasn't meant to be. So, so for now I'm showing you just some examples that indeed there is an effect, but I don't know where in this space where the sweet spot is that will be then uh, for maybe for next year. Um, so uh, let me quickly summarize. Right? So what that show us that autonomy in complex natural environment is possible. Right, so no matter how badly we have failed so far achieving it, the bats do it a billion times every night. Right? Um, I think uh, this is my hypothesis, uh, but I think there's four uh, key components here. The first is you have to look at what happens in the periphery. I believe this is very important right, because uh, you know I mean the, the soft these information processing systems right they follow a Markov chain right so if you at the beginning if you don't encode it you can do later whatever you want right you, you're not going to get it back so the periphery is important and I think that's why bats have evolved eight muscles on the nose sleeve twenty plus muscles on each ear right that that speaks to this importance right so this gateway is really important so I think that's the first important thing then. How do you represent the signal after that? Your primary representation, I think that needs uh, some attention. Then how do you do the neuromorphic signal representation, uh, the computing? And then for future work, what we're really interested in is how do you close the loop? How do you control that? Well, if you look at the bat, we have not done that in any depth. But I can tell you for sure from our pilot data, by these ear motions, the nose leaf motions, they do change. They constantly change. So the animals have them under control. And how do they do that? Right? So that's, that's something that we would like um, to know. So our pilot data shows that indeed all these factors have an impact on, on coding capacity. Um, and then future work is, of course, to look at useful information about coding capacity. Doesn't mean all that much, but it's really the quality, the information that you, that you put in there. Um, we want to think about better neuromorphic computing, both in paradigms and in hardware, and that's why I came to this meeting, right? because I hope you can give me uh, some advice on that or maybe even collaborate. Uh, and then the question of adaptive control, how can we actually close the loop between what we get and then what do we do in the periphery. So that's all I had. I quickly acknowledge uh, my sponsors, and if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Rolf. <laughs> I believe uh, we do have time, but before that, I do want to comment that uh, we were debating about uh, an activity for future NICE conference where we, we may actually blindfold some attendees with uh, artificial ears and see how many walls they hit over time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great fun. Of course, you all will have to sign a, a waiver <laughs> before you do that. <laughs> um, just a couple of things. So. You feed your like your deep model, your deep, this convolutional mm -hmm. networks. You feed them this kind of uh, kind of frequency decomposition and so mm -hmm. on. But since you're dealing with sound, wouldn't it be more natural to feed like uh, to use wave uh, wave net or something like that? I mean, it is it. I mean, particularly if you're interested in the mm -hmm. features that in the filters that you would mm -hmm. get later. Yeah, so. I mean, there's definitely other options to do it. But I mean, the the the, the what the cochlea does is like a filter bank. But so if you have a spike gram where you have a frequency axis with made with bandpass filters and then a time axis, that is sort of a representation that is natural to that. And then it's also a good match for the convolutional neural networks work since they are made. So we said, okay, let's try that one. But I'm 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 completely with you, right? There might be other alternative ways and you know you might find something and, and it could be insightful, yes. So so this is really sort of a, a random well, informed random pick, right? But yeah. there, there would be there could be other ones. Yes. Just a quick short one. Um, 
you also had these differences between entropies, but I mean, the differential entropies don't mean much, but they're different, mm. especially if you, I mean, basically, if you assume that the dynamic contains the information mm. of the static, then mm. that's just a mutual information, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, conditional, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah so, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So the years are moving, mm. uh, and I, I understand they're uh, trying to get a sort of a spectrograph, mm. but aren't they maybe following certain features uh, that that they are getting at a given position, and uh, and basically it's sort of they get a spectrograph of the area they see in open space or or certain object they want to, and then they orient themselves to mm. to get more details on that area or mm. or follow that as they move in the space. Yeah. I think that there is an orientation component, right? So the ears, actually, those bats, they, interestingly, they have two types of ear motions. One ear motion is a rigid rotation. So that means the geometry of the ear stays the same. It is just rotated somewhere else in space. So that is something that we do in technology as well, right? So the idea is you have a limited beam. You know where your source is or where your target is where you want, and you orient yourself to that, right? So if I want to listen to what you are telling me, right, I'm not going to focus my ears over here. So that's happening. But then the bats, they have another mode, which is this non-rigid mode, right? And that means that the pinna is really changing shape. So now you get a different transfer function, a different spectrum, and you get a different, right? It's changing continuously, right? So the echo comes and the ear is moving. It's moving on the same time scale. So every time point in the echo is seen with a different transfer function. So you get that kind of spectrogram-like thing, but in that spectrogram-like thing, the, what happens along the frequency axis for each point in time is different. And uh, no, no technical system that would do that. Uh, and then does that frequency of their modulation varies with situation to situation, or that remains constant? Uh, I think it, it, it so I'm, I'm speaking now, I don't have quantitative data, I'm just speaking from the data that I have seen and sort of using my own brain as the data processor here. But it, it, it's, it, there's a lot of variability in this system, right? So it seems to be that it goes with the pulse rate, so these motions, they are popped coupled to the pulses, so the pulse rate, they vary this, and it goes up with that. Um, there's a lot of variability in the orientation of the ears. Um, I'm not sure the, these deformation motions, are there different patterns? It seems like there are, but that needs to be investigated. So the animals have a lot of variability in there, and my hunch is that they control that based on the situation, right? So for example, right, when you do those experiments with the bats, right, so if you wonder how we got that data actually on the real bats, right, you put the bat, you let it hang in the lab, right? So you make it comfortable, they're like little pets, right? They're waiting for a reward. Uh, and then to make them the ear motions, you really have to keep them entertained, right? If you always offer them the same thing, it will die down very quickly. They will still use their sonar system, right? So their sonar will go pulse, 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 but you have to find something new. So so, so the students who did that work, they really had to become bat entertainers and say, hey, well, what if I do this in front of the bat or I do that? Right? So, so it seems to be that novelty is, a very, is very important in, in triggering those. Thank you, Rolf. Hmm? Okay, thank you very much.